Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, if you're looking to be in the uh, rose pruning class or the uh, spring rose care class, you're in the right place. Let's see if this works. Ta-da! Perfect. Okay, one of the things that uh, a lot of people find is that they're they're confused because they go on the internet and they Google rose care and uh, they find they get something like uh, two th million responses and uh, they start looking at them and uh, hardly any two are exactly the same as far as being able to tell you uh, how to uh, take care of your roses. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've done, of course, as Master Gardeners, we restricted ourselves to passing on information to the public that has been uh, researched or research-based. And that's the only uh, kind of information that we can let the public know or recommend to the public about roses or vegetables or anything else. What we did, we went onto the internet a couple of years ago and we found that New Mexico State University already has a publication out called of all things, Growing Roses. And it's available online for free, it doesn't cost you anything. If you just Google Growing Roses, NMSU, uh, it should come up on your uh, on your computer. On the other hand, it's also available at the uh, Master Gardener website uh, underneath the uh, Gardening Topics links uh, tab. Just scroll down and you'll find the section with all the rose documents on it. If you hadn't noticed, and if it's working correctly, uh, down at the bottom of the screen, uh, you should see uh, Spanish subtitles. And this is the first time that we've used this feature for presentations. Uh, I will, again, apologize in advance if I uh, appear to be saying something untoward or, or funny that uh, the the subtitles aren't exactly catching the translation because of what I'm saying. But if that's the case, uh, don't blame me, please. Uh, get a hold of uh, Microsoft or Bill Gates, and it's their fault. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons that we selected uh, Growing Roses as a publication to follow as sort of a, a textbook is that, as I said, it is research-based uh, by the Extension Service up in New Mexico. And of course, they have the similar climate and soils that we do here in El Paso. So it, it really is an ideal publication, uh, as opposed to some other publications that are available from other universities. Uh, for example, uh, the University of uh, Arizona <coughs> uses uh, a lot of information they are gathered from the, uh, the low desert. And that isn't exactly it appropriate for you uh, roses here in El Paso. Okay. First of all, I'd like to talk to you about scouting, fertilizing, and watering roses. Uh, scouting is something that uh, we all do uh, just as a matter of course, whenever we run into a nursery or a garden center and we're browsing for a, a plant to take home with us and we're, we're looking for the best possible plant one that doesn't have any damage to it, <laughs> one that's been watered recently by the staff at the uh, garden center, it's not drooping over, and uh, just the healthiest plant that we can get. Uh, that's important because we don't want to be bringing home problems into our own landscape that haven't been there before. Once you get that plant home after you've decided to purchase it, make sure that you do frequent yeah. scouting of that plant and your other uh, plants in your landscape for any initial uh, signs of program, uh, problems. Watering roses, this is probably the biggest problem that people in El Paso uh, face with all their landscape plants is getting the adequate amount of water out to the plants so they don't become crispy critters. Uh, roses as, as a, a group of plants are very heavy drinkers, particularly during the summertime, they can take around three gallons per day from the soil 
surrounding their re their roots uh, during the summer. So it's very important that their uh, moisture level in the soil around the roots is kept at the appropriate level. Um, of course, that all depends on your weather, <clears throat> the type of soil that you've got at your property, uh, the size and the age of the old, of the rows, and also the microclimate that it may be situated in. Uh, the other thing to remember that if you've got your roses growing in containers uh, out on the patio, they're going to need more frequent watering. And so it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's important to go ahead and check and adjust the water frequency as needed. And people say, well, how do I, how do I know when to water? Well, uh, the good Lord all gave us probably the best measuring uh, tool for measuring moisture in soil. And that's your index finger. If you can stick your index finger down below the mulch level and feel that the soil is mulch, uh, is uh, cool, uh, then you probably don't have to water. If you go down a little bit deeper and you don't feel that the soil is, mo is not moist down about uh, two or three inches into the soil, uh, then it's time to water. And the thing that <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize is you need to soak the soil down to a, about two feet around the rows to make sure that you get enough water down to the root system. And that is because, of course, that as roses grow in your soil, they extend their uh, feeder roots out away from the base of the rose or the crown of the rose. And so it can be out two or three times away from the uh, middle of the canopy of the rose. And you're, you're really not doing it at any favors just by watering around down around the, uh, the base of the rose. You can okay. see out how, how far out from away from the, uh, the crown of the rose that the, uh, the root system will eventually grow. The people that um, plant a rose and put a little basin around the base of the rose and uh, then fill it full of water and then they fill it full of water in a week or so and they kept using that same basin uh, for months if not years and you're not doing the rose any good because you're not getting moisture out to where the roots are and where the moisture will be taken up by those roots. Uh, the other thing is if you're depending upon uh, a water source like a sprinkler system that you've got in ground for a lawn, uh, you're not doing the rose any favors also. Because number one, if you if you planted the rose in the lawn and it's having to compete with a, a turf grass, the turf grass is going to win every time because they're much more adapt to picking up water uh, that is supplied on top of them than roses are. Uh, the second thing is that uh, about the Oh, six months, you want to extend the water uh, out to, or you're watering, out to and past the drip line so that you're watering the area in where the rose roots are really growing. Uh, in other areas, uh, the roses are susceptible if you water them all the time up around their uh, base of the uh, of the rose itself, they're susceptible to getting uh, a rot or a fungus around the base of the rose that could injure it and kill it off later on. So remember, anyway, just remember after the rose is mature to make sure that you're watering from the drip line out about two or three times uh, the height of the, or the width of the canopy. The other thing is if you put down about two or three inches of organic mulch around uh, the rows, that'll help maintain the soil moisture so that the, uh, the rose uh, isn't uh, losing so much moisture from the soil as a result of uh, transpiration or evaporation. What we're looking for and what your goal should be is uniformly moist soil, but you shouldn't water so much that the soil becomes soggy. And that's again up to you as to uh, how frequently you have to water and you have to keep scouting that just to make sure that you're not uh, not getting an adequate water to your rows. <coughs> uh, 
All right, fertilizing roses uh, at first seems rather complex because uh, you talk about uh, oh hydrogen ions being transferred in the soil between uh, nutrients and so forth, and uh, you talk about the three major nutrients. Well, it's it's, it's really a lot simpler than that. Number one, uh, that you need to apply nitrogen throughout the growing season to every rose that you've got. Uh, not very much, uh, just a couple of tablespoons is adequate per, uh, per month or up to six weeks. Uh, but nitrogen is the main nutrient that your roses need to do well in the summer, particularly here in El Paso, where our soils don't normally uh, contain a lot of nitrogen. And they, your soil may need phosphorus, I say may need, uh, at the start of the growing season uh, to assist in bud development so that you've got lots of flowers during the year. And some very light desert soils, now what's a light desert soil? That would be a light uh, sandy soil probably, uh, might need a supplemental potassium application. But that's not often the case, particularly around El Paso. Generally, most normal desert soils have adequate potassium in there already. But how do you know? Well, the answer, of course, is the, the bottom line there. Soil testing prevents guessing. If, if you test your soil every two or three years for your roses, uh, you should get a very good idea about the status of the nutrients in your soil and how what nutrients absolutely need to be uh, applied to give your roses uh, the best opportunity to show off their stuff. And if you need a soil testing kit or information about how to take a, uh, a soil test, you can contact the El Paso AgriLife Extension Office, uh, and I'll give you the telephone number later on, or you can contact the Master Gardener Help Desk at the same phone number. Just hang on, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, that Growing Roses publication from New Mexico State University that I already mentioned has a, a very good discussion about uh, applying nitrogen and particularly nitrogen and phosphorus applications uh, throughout the year. And their, their assumption is, number one, that you've got a soil test already. And that soil test says whether or not your soil needs to have phosphorus applied to it. If it's no, you go down to the next box. I've lost my pointer there. Uh, and all you need to do is provide two tablespoons of ammonium sulfate. Uh, and you can find those at, at most uh, nurseries and at uh, many garden centers in the big box stores. Just, just look, look for the numbers on the front of the package. It'll say 2100. That tells you that uh, it's got 21% by weight of nitrogen in that package. And then just give, as I say, two tablespoons of ammonium sulfate per bush every four to six weeks from the bud break time. That's early in the, uh, the springtime, very early in the springtime or even late winter until October, around October 25th. Okay, good information there. On the other hand, if your soil test says, yeah, you need to give your soil some uh, phosphorus, what they recommend that you do is you put down a quarter cup of ammonium phosphate. Now the numbers on the outside of the packages for ammonium phosphate will be 1620-0, meaning it's got some uh, phosphates in it, about 20% my weight. Or you, as down here at the bottom, it says you can use also 10-10-0, 10-20-0, or probably the most frequently found ammonium phosphate and most uh, gardening uh, outlets, or even a, a um, hardware store will be 1620-0. Uh, that's a recommended uh, analysis that uh, New Mexico State University recommends. And when do you put that down? Well, again, in the early spring or, or 
or late winter. Um, hard to tell in El Paso, of course, but before the buds break on the roses. And then again, another quarter cup after you get four to six inches of new growth on the roses. And then finally, you put down another quarter cup of 1620 or ammonium phosphate after the first blossoms have faded. And that's all you have to do. So that doesn't, that, that's uh, three quarters of a cup of ammonium phosphate is all you need uh, each year to get your roses off to a good start. If, if your soil test says that you need phosphorus in your soil. And then after you've done that, after the first blossoms have faded, then you go over and you just start uh, applying your ammonium phosphate, just as if it had said that you don't need phosphorus to be applied. And again, that's two tablespoons every four to six weeks. Now that may be a little bit confusing, but it's not quite as confusing to follow this chart as it is to follow the uh, text that's in the New Mexico publication. And so uh, that, that's why we have this chart up here. It's, it's not in the publication, but uh, you should be able to read through that publication's uh, discussion of fertilization and you'll find the same basic directions uh, just in the uh, different phrases. Okay, now is where we're going to get. Doc? Yes. Doc, just a quick question in reference to what you covered. Um, where do you put the two the two uh, tablespoons of ammonium sulfate uh, per bush means where exactly? Uh, on the ground. That's that's where it needs to be uh, kind of worked into the uh, top layer of soil, you know. Uh, and so it doesn't take an awful lot for a complete bush and just don't dump that uh, uh, two tablespoons in the same spot. Kind of sprinkle them around underneath the, uh, the bush, uh, someplace between the crown and the, uh, the drip uh, zone. And that should be able to get down to the roots. Of course, as your bushes mature and after they become established, uh, you're going to be putting down the same amounts but on a larger area, because as I showed you before, in the watering slides, uh, your root zones are going to be extending out from the center of the bush. So uh, that means that you're putting out small amounts of fertilizer on a larger area as your bush matures. I hope that answers your question. Good question. Okay, next slide. And this is the one. Okay, next slide. And this is the one that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, this is the one that we use to instruct new master gardeners for the interns that are maybe looking on at the uh, the rose garden. You've seen this one before, uh, but it's shorter than last time. So just bear with me here. Uh, rose brooding is is one thing about caring for roses that really gives people a lot of uh, problems. They're so afraid that by cutting off their roses every year that they're going to damage them. Uh, that's not true. The thing to remember, first of all, that roses are just sh shrubs with showy flowers. Uh, I mean, you, you regularly go out and you trim back all your shrubs in your landscape. Uh, just make sure that their their size is maintained within a certain limit. Uh, you can do the same thing with roses. But let me help you even more. Uh, David Austin, the founder of David Austin Roses, uh, wrote one time in one of his books that pruning is not an exact science, so you should never worry about doing harm. Uh, I, I can't give you the title of the book. I, it's, it's in the library someplace. Uh, and I've looked and looked and looked. But I can tell you it was from David Austin. I wrote it down. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Austin is no longer with us. He passed away in uh, 2018. Uh, so we can't ascertain exactly which book it's in. 
but just take my words for it. Uh, it's in a book. If you don't believe me, uh, follow this advice. When in doubt, cut it out. Okay. Why prune annually? Well, number one, of course, is, as I said, is you want to control the size and the shape of your rose bush. Uh, some rose bushes, uh, if you don't prune them uh, on an annual basis, can really get out of control, uh, can capture the entire landscape. Uh, some will go out uh, 20 feet or more. Some will grow up into trees, and you have a, a more different, difficult time taking care of those, of course. But the main thing is to control the size and the shape of the roses. But by pruning them annually, you will also encourage the roses to put out new growth and to form new blossoms. Uh, if you just allow them to grow on their own, uh, they will do that, as I say. And they'll get larger and larger, and the, uh, the uh, blossoms will get smaller and smaller. The third reason, of course, is to give you a chance to get in there and prune out any damaged, dead, or diseased canes. Uh, those we call the 3Ds. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, but it's pretty easy to figure out for yourself. And the, the final thing for uh, pruning annually is that you improve the air circulation through the rose. Uh, and by doing that, you'll improve the chances of not getting a fungal disease because they need moisture to grow on uh, when they attack the leaves. The second thing is that you'll open up the center of the rose bush to sunlight, which helps get sunlight down to the interior of the rose and uh, helps with the uh, manufacture of uh, energy nutrients for the roots. Okay. Uh, this is the biggest question I guess probably we get besides what's the best fertilizer for roses is uh, when to start pruning. Incidentally, there is no best fertilizer for roses. Uh, you just get a soil test and it'll tell you what you need to add. So when does it start pruning? Well, the, the school book solution, uh, and, and online too, uh, is that you should start pruning in late winter just before the bud eyes break on the canes. Well, of course, that's a different date in every location because Mother Nature, Mother Nature has her own calendar and she doesn't publicize when uh, springtime is going to break out, particularly in El Paso. Generally, in El Paso, we'll go out in early to mid-January and we'll find that the buds on the roses in the rose garden have already broken. And in some cases, in some years, uh, we've already got shoots coming out rather than just a, a small bud eye. However, in, in, in most of Texas, and uh, for good reason, if you look at the weather forecast for this weekend in El Paso, uh, Valentine's Day is the traditional day to kind of start about thinking about pruning your roses. And of course, this, this weekend, we're supposed to get snow for a couple of days and the temperatures down below freezing. So. Uh, if you haven't heard of that news and already, just go ahead and take it from Doc Stalker that you need to start planning to bring your plants in that are not freeze tolerant and uh, also to turn off your sprinkler systems because it is going to be winter again. Okay, uh, just as a word of advice, you need to wait to prune your once blooming roses. Uh, those are generally your your old garden climbers and so forth. And any rose that you've planted within the past year, it, it doesn't need to be pruned that first year. It's, it's still putting out new growth and that new growth will provide additional nutrients down to the root system uh, that will help it grow and take off next year. So just remember that. Uh, on your once blooming roses, you can wait until they finish blooming that a first flush of blooms, and then go ahead and do your normal pruning on those. And of course, people ask us all the time, what's the best pruners that we should use? Well, number one, uh, there's there's all kinds of pruners on the market today. And 
they all cost different amounts. Uh, some are fairly expensive. Uh, some are middle of the price range. And of course, there's some Mel cheapos out there too as well. Uh, you want to get the uh, most substantial pruner with a good metal blade on it uh, that has got uh, as many metal parts on it as you can find. Uh, I would try to avoid buying pruners that are uh, filled with plastic parts because those are prone to break off. Uh, these are two pruners made by the same company. Uh, one of them is a bypass pruner. The other is a annual pruner. Uh, and they both look pretty much alike, uh, ex except that there's some very uh, big differences between those two types. Number one, the uh, bypass pruners, uh, which are called uh, in Great Britain, Great Britain and France, succateurs. Uh, if you're looking for pruners online uh, and you're shopping uh, in the United Kingdom, you want to make sure that you're uh, Googling for succateurs and not uh, bypass pruners or bypass shears. Anyway, the difference with, whoops, I've got this on my knee. There we go. All right, uh, the, the difference between the two pruners is that the bypass pruners, the blades bypass each other like a pair of shears or a pair of scissors. And that gives you a very precise, very clean cut. Anvil pruners, on the other hand, have a blade that catches the uh, piece of the rose that you want to prune between itself, the blade, and the anvil, as you see with our ear goes, which is just a piece of metal and is not sharpened at all. And then it crushes that piece of the rose and they tend to crush soft plant tissue. And that's not what we want. So we try to discourage people from using ample pruners as opposed to bypass pruners when they're pruning their roses and other uh, soft tissue parts on plants in their garden. Uh, the, the, course, the, the question always comes up, well, what good is an anvil pruner in the first place? Why do they make so many of them? Well, the answer is that they are probably better than bypass pruners in cutting out dead wood. And that is uh, dead that, a wood that, that has already died and needs to be removed from a rose or from a tree or from a shrub. Uh, they just do a better job. I'm not saying that you should buy one uh, unless you've got a lot of dead wood that you're having to prune out of trees. Anyway, use the anvil pruner. Next thing, it's important to keep your uh, bypass pruners sharp and clean. And uh, you need to sharpen them before. And if you're pruning more than rows, more than one rows, you need to get yourself some sort of a sharpening device. Uh, here, this one is a, uh, a small diamond sharpening uh, stick. And this one down here by Corona, the same people that made that uh, bypass pruner I was showing you on the other slide. Uh, this is a sharpening device too as well uh, with a end on it that is harder than the steel in the uh, pruner itself. So it takes off a uh, little slab of of metal every time that you rub it against the uh, the blade and makes uh, for easy work to sharpen your your pruners you want to keep them sharp so you always got a good cut uh, and you can you can dull a, a, a pruner very easily just by pruning one rose the other thing is that <clears throat> the blades of the pruners both the blades this blade in the back sometimes called the bill and of course, the, the primary cutting blade uh, will oftentimes get uh, fouled with, uh, with uh, sap from the uh, pruning process and also dirt from the, uh, from the uh, canes being pruned. And I've found, uh, quite frankly, that uh, disinfecting wipes, uh, not necessarily by Clorox, but anything that's got disinfectants on the wipes, do a pretty good job of cleaning off the uh, the schmutt that you get on your your blades. 
uh, when it's fresh. Uh, if you let it dry on there, you may have to use uh, a high grade sandpaper to get it off. But uh, Clorox wipes do a good job. Also, when you get through pruning your rose or roses, you want to make sure that after you clean them, you want to apply some oil. Now, it doesn't have to be three in one oil, just a light coat of oil on both blades just to keep them from rusting. Uh, these use uh, a very good quality carbon steel, but uh, that it's not stainless steel, so if there's any moisture left on there at all, uh, when you come back to pick up your pruners again, you're going to find that your uh, blades are covered with rust if you haven't put oil on. Okay. Here's some pretty good representations of what 3Ds look like. Uh, the top picture up here shows an area where a cane that was next to this cane has been blown across it repeatedly and taken off the uh, tissue of the cane and exposes the interior of the cane to bacteria and to uh, insects that want to lay their eggs and disturb tissues on, on plants. So you want to cut that uh, damaged area off, prune it off. We'll talk about that in just a second. Here's a pretty good representation of what happens when uh, you prune a cane too high. Uh, you sometimes get pruning dieback, and that's an area where the uh, the prune down below the pruning cut becomes discolored, sometimes gray, sometimes brown. Uh, but that's an area of uh, tissue that needs to be re removed from the uh, from the bush. So you need to go down and do another pruning cut down below that. And of course, this is the most easily identified. This is where you've got a diseased portion on your cane and you need to prune this cane off down below this cut. The main thing is that when you do that cut, as I'll show you in a second, you do uh, you need to ascertain that you've gotten all of this necrotic tissue off of the uh, off of the rose and thrown into the trash. And the way that you do that, you look for a nice creamy color in that pruned area, just at the cut area. Uh, interns always ask us, well, how much should we remove from the roses that we're going to be pruning in the rose garden? Well, again, in the, uh, the first year, only the three Ds, the uh, uh, damaged, diseased, and dying uh, portions of the plant need to be removed in the first year. However, in the second year, when you're doing your annual pruning, you probably ought to be looking to reducing that height of the rose by about one third to one half. And what happens then is you're going to get renewed vigor in those canes, and you're also going to get more blossoms on your rose. Now, they will be smaller than if you reduce the rose even further, say down to a two-thirds cut down around this area. Uh, you'll get fewer, but the blossoms will generally be much larger. Doc, um, before you get any further, um... There's two questions um, from Blanca. Uh, she asked. Missourians who can hear you. Hello? Yeah. Doc, uh, two questions. Um, should uh, they wait to prune their rose bushes until after this uh, freezing weekend, or can they do it now? And the second one. Um, Anne was asking, does too high mean too far above the bud? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes to both questions. Uh, in more detail, uh, it's going to be cold this Sunday, you know, Valentine's Day. So stay inside. Uh, enjoy your can candy and uh, looking at roses that somebody has given to you. But uh, I would I would wait. Uh, roses are susceptible uh, to freezing. And uh, so if you prune before 
we have this middle of the winter freeze that's been forecast, uh, you may have to go back in and uh, reprune it because some of the areas that you left exposed uh, to the freezing temperatures uh, did indeed suffer from frostbite. Okay, so I'd go ahead and wait. It's not too late yet. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's really not too late. Uh, but there's some uh, biological reasons why it's better to go ahead and prune before the buds break. Uh, because you will get uh, more activity in the uh, area of growth and uh, blooming than if you wait until later. Okay, and I didn't want to get into uh, a biology class or a, a botany class, but there's some chemical reasons because there are some things that happened uh, that caused the buds to break in the first place, and they've got the right chemicals. Uh, being furnished to them at that time. But if you wait later, uh, you're going to have shoots and it's just a, a more problematic to do it, uh, say, in uh, the middle of the summer rather than in the early or late winter. Okay. Uh, forgotten what the other question was? Uh, um, just, uh, I think you covered it, but uh, the question was, is too does too high mean too far above yes. the bud yes and i i should show you a picture here in a second okay thank you um this is uh this is one of the things that some people don't realize about uh looking at your rose and trying to decide what you're going to do to it uh a lot of what you need to do to a rose uh, has really been determined by that rose. And you should know about how high your rose is supposed to be growing. I mean, if if you buy a, uh, a patio rose, which is a small miniature rose, and you're expecting it to, to grow up and be like a hedge, well, you're going to be disappointed. And so uh, you're maybe going to forego pruning that patio rose every year in the expectation that it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, cultivars of roses do have limitations. And so rather than uh, trying to have them meet your expectations, try to meet the expectations of the rose. That's the first thing. Uh, and so you should do your due diligence before you buy a rose so that you know what to expect other than just does it have a fragrance and does it have a color uh, that you're going to be uh, wanting to uh, have in your in your garden. Uh, size is a big determinant factor. So make sure that when you buy any plant for that matter, that you know what the what the mature size is. And it's, that's why you see uh, so many of these uh, large Huge is, is, is a big is a bigger descriptor of it. These huge shrubs planted up near the sidewalk of people's uh, houses, and they've just outgrown uh, the shape that they should be in. And the only way to uh, to make them maintain that shape uh, is to you know hack them down every year and just keep them at a, a level that they really weren't intended by nature to grow at. Uh, Anyway, enough of that. Get off my my soapbox. <clears throat> well, we've talked a, an awful lot about bud eyes, and on roses, uh, they're fairly easy to find, particular, particularly at the uh, the middle of the winter or in El Paso. Sometimes, you know, right after New Year's Eve, uh, every every rose cane will have a spot where either a leaf used to be or there's still a leaf attached and that's attached to the cane by what they call the leaf axle and down inside that axle is where the buds are developed and there's more than one bud so you know just so that you know that and it depends on each cultivar about how many buds are down in there so if if you make a mistake on a on a rose and the the, uh, the leaf axle is still there and uh, the bud eyes haven't been completely uh, cut into little pieces. Uh, eventually, they will 
uh, send out a new bud and a new uh, shoot where that where that uh, leaf scar is at. If that leaf drops off, or if you pull it off, uh, then you're going to see that there's a leaf scar that will develop. And that bud, or the bud eye, will develop just above that leaf scar. Pretty easy, easy to see. And in, in many cases, on even on an old, crusty uh, uh, cane that you find on, on an old established rose like we have in the... Uh, in the garden, at uh, the municipal garden, you'll find that there'll be uh, bud eyes that will appear there in the spring too as well. So they can be all over a cane. But you're looking for a bud eye and you're going to be cutting at that point. And here is what we call the traditional pruning cut. Uh, this is a cut that's been developed and passed down for uh, decades, if, if not centuries. And uh, it it's this way for a number of reasons. Number one, you want to start with a cane that is thicker than a number two pencil. Okay, um, On some roses, you're going to find that most of your canes are going to be larger than a number two pencil so that you've got a lot of canes to choose from. On the other hand, on some roses, you'll find some cultivars, it seems that all they have are uh, canes that are smaller than a number two pencil. So you really are in a quandary of what to do. And we'll talk about that in a second. So anyway, start, start with a substantial sized cane that's bigger than a number two pencil. Number two, you want to find a shoot or a bud eye that faces away from the center of the bush. Now, in this case, it's a shoot, but here you can see where the leaf scar is. And the, the important thing about this is that this needs to point away from the center of the bush because this is the direction that cane or the, or the new branch is going to grow out, out this direction. You don't want it growing back into the center of the bush where it's going to block the sunlight and also give you a problem with ventilation. A lot of people say, well, it, it needs to be an outward facing bud eye. That, you'll hear that term a lot. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees to the center of the bush. It can be up to the, either side of it, uh, but just make sure that it doesn't point directly into uh, the center of the bush or that it's going to be uh, growing over the top of a already existing branch off a different cane. And that's the hard part that a lot of people have is trying to decide, well, okay, here's a, here's a shoot or here's a butt eye, but it's, it's pointed in a, in a direction that's not in the center, but is it good enough? In most cases, it will be good enough. All right, next, you want to make your cut starting above the butt eye, oh, about an eighth of an inch, okay? Remember that when you find this with the butt eye on it, the butt eye is gonna be down here about the center of the chute. So when I say an eighth of an inch, this doesn't look like an eighth of an inch, but you need to cut, start your cut above the chute or above the butt, butt eye. And that will, in most cases, prevent having that pruning die back. Lastly, after you get through pruning off the, the top of the cane, you want to check back down and make sure that the center of that cane is creamy white. If it's miscolored, if it's brown, if it looks like brown sugar, then you need to go down further, find another butt eye or, or another shoot and make another cut until you've got a creamy white center. That's a healthy center on a rose. Next steps. The next thing you need to do is to go back in and you remove any twiggy canes and any canes smaller than a pencil, number two pencil. And here's a good example. Here's two canes that are smaller than a number two pencil. 
you don't have to carry a number two pencil to be able to do this, by the way. And you just slice them off here next to the main cane that they're growing out of. And also, you need to uh, prune off any canes that may be growing into the center. Uh, this this uh, picture doesn't show that, but if you've got a, a, a branch or a cane that's growing into the center of it, just trim it back. Uh, on canes that are bigger than a number two pencil, uh, you can go down and look for a, uh, a bud eye or a shoot on the uh, outside of the cane that, sent, that faces away from the center. And uh, you can sometimes cut that uh, cane that was uh, growing into the center to a point where it's not growing into the center anymore. But anyway, you, you want to leave the center as clear of uh, growth as you can. Cleaning up. Uh, you want to go back in and you want to check. You want to remove any of the remaining old blossoms that may still be on the, the rose. Any rose hips, those are a uh, little red or, or green little balls that used to be blossoms that have turned into seed pods. And any leaves that still may be attached to the canes. Now, that seems to be quite a job if you look at uh, some roses are almost evergreen. And it's difficult uh, to, even after you get through pruning, to pick off all those leaves. But many insects uh, will winter over on a rosebud uh, by laying uh, their, la their eggs on the bottom of leaves or in crevices on the roses, or they'll hide underneath the leaves until the warm weather returns. So by taking those leaves off, uh, in a lot of cases, you're reducing the potential for having insects show up as soon as it warms up enough for them to, to grow and start eating on your roses. You want to check and see if you've missed anything, uh, any of the 3Ds, that you've got uh, all of your canes cleaned up and they're at the, about the same height. And uh, then you want to clean up your cuttings that are laying on the ground and any leaf debris around the base of the rose. Leave it clean. Because remember, these leaves that used to be on the rose will fall into the ground and any eggs that may have been laid there will now be just at the base of the rose. Those insects will, uh, will pop out when it gets warm and climb up into your rose. And then the last thing you can do is renew your uh, mulch layer. Uh, so you got that uh, two or three inches of mulch uh, around the uh, roots of the rose. Pretty simple. Uh, we didn't talk to the interns about this because we were uh, turning them to uh, prune specifically uh, some of the most uh, sought after roses in the, in the uh, rose trade by people who are planting roses. And those are the uh, tea roses and your uh, multifloras and your grandifloras. Uh, which are basically very upright roses. But if you've got a, uh, a shrub rose, or you're trying to grow a hedge, or if they're, they're even called hedge roses, where you grow them together uh, to form a hedge or a barrier, uh, you just need to lightly shear them back by no more than one third of their height. Uh, on David Austin roses, he recommends that you shear his roses back by one half every year. Uh, I just pass that on in case that you've got a David Austin rose and rose growing in your, your landscape. Miniature patio roses. Uh, this is the type of rose that you're going to find where all your all your canes and all of your um, shoots growing out from your, your canes on the roses are all going to be less than the size of a number two pencil. So you just shear them to shape. And all you do is just lightly cut them around into the shape that you want. Uh, as I say, lightly. You know, you don't want to go in there and chop off, you know, half of them. Just trim them back to get into the old growth. And then you can go in and see if there's any dead, diseased, or damaged canes that need to come out too as well. 
And by shearing, uh, if you've got a, a fairly large patio rose or a miniature rose, which can be up to be about four feet tall, by the way, uh, that type of cultivar, uh, you can actually use garden head shears on your rose. Uh, you're not going to kill them. Uh, you're not going to damage them that much. Uh, and it's a lot easier job. Now, included within shrub roses are roses like your knockout roses. And these are often planted in groups, as you'll see later, uh, to form a hedge or in an entire bed. And those roses are most easily pruned back in the spring uh, just by using a regular hedge trimmer. And the, in the municipal garden, that's what we use. We use uh, now a, a, a battery powered hedge trimmer to cut those roses back and they do real well. Going right along. Climbing roses. Uh, this is a, uh, a real problem for a lot of uh, people who've got a climbing rose. They say, well, I'm going to need to tie that to a trellis. And they get one of these conventional trellises that kind of look like a vase. Uh, and they tie their canes or their climber directly onto that uh, trellis. And every year as the canes get longer, they keep attaching it. So the canes are growing vertically. And then they'll ask a question, why don't I have more blossoms on my climbing rows? Well, that's because of the way that, excuse me, that climbing roses grow or, or blossom best. And that's when you have the canes growing horizontally, or at least as much horizontally as possible. Okay, so let's go into the pruning techniques for climbing roses. But keep that in mind. Generally on, on climbers and on ramblers, your canes for the rose emanate from the ground. And they'll have singular canes that grow up, a whole bunch of them. Other, other roses will have a more tree-like uh, structure where they'll have four or five canes that will grow out of the crown of the rose. But then on top of that, they'll have an, uh, other branches that will grow off until it really looks more like a tree than it does uh, a climbing rose, which looks like a rose that if you didn't tie those canes up, they would just flop onto the ground. A long... And, and, and those those canes that, that come up from the ground are called the main canes. And they are the canes that actually have a growing tip on them. And that's where all your growth, as far as your length of your cane, is going to go to. We're getting ahead of ourselves. This is the growing tip out here where my pointer is going around. But between the ground all the way along the main cane out to the growing tip, you're going to find other branches that come off that are called laterals. And on these laterals is where that you're going to find your blossoms being divided, uh, developed all along that main cane. So again, if you keep your main cane growing horizontally, and not prune off your tip, uh, you're going to find that you're going to achieve the most branches, uh, most uh, blossoms on that rose. Sorry about that. So anyway, uh, how do you prune a climbing rose? Well, you go in each year, you're going to find that you've got different size laterals, and you, you can prune them back to about two or three butt eyes, on that lateral or to about six inches, much like a grapevine. <clears throat> Excuse me. All along, all along the main cane. Just be sure that you don't uh, cut off that lateral because if you do, 
it's the, that cane is going to expend most of its time and most of its nutrients this year to regrowing what used to be uh, the growth tip. Now, I should point out to you that if something happens along, for example, this main cane, something happens, this, this gets broken off. Uh, this gets hit, well, not by a lightning bolt, but by another tree branch or something like that. And it becomes dead or dying or something like that. What you can do, actually, is you can go back and you can take one of your longer laterals and you can prune that rose off here, which, in fact, you're doing is you're cutting off that growth tip. And the growth tip on this lateral will become the growth tip for the main cane that you've just created. I hope that's clear. Uh, that's a concept a lot of people don't understand. Uh, they go they go ahead and they they prune back all the laterals before they they get to the uh, the growth tip, and they'll find that there's some damage that's been done out here way away from all the laterals that have already already been pruned back, and they don't have a long lateral that they can substitute for this damaged growth tip. So just keep that in mind. That's that's one of the key things about uh, pruning back climbing roses. And the last thing is that when you tie your, your main canes up again, make sure that you can get them as much horizontal as possible uh, because that's going to increase your blooms. That's my big secret. Okay, dead hanging roses. Uh, after you've trimmed all your, your leaves and your uh, pruned your, your canes, uh, your rose is going to go through a period of uh, reestablishing more leaves, more canes, and then eventually blossoms. And that takes anywhere uh, between four to six weeks before you've got uh, a good uh, crop of leaves and you've got uh, blossom buds coming out and your roses are going to be uh, going into full bloom. Probably around, if you do it like we do, probably around the middle of April. So once your blossoms have faded, like these have, uh, left to their own designs, roses will go ahead. And if these blossoms have been fertilized by a bee or another insect, then they will form seed pods. And those little seed pods uh, are going to transmit back to the rose that, hey, we need to uh, give you some advice. It's getting towards the end of the growth season because we're forming seeds out here and you don't need to put up any more blossoms. So if you find uh, rose hips growing or these seed pods growing on your roses in the middle of the spring, go ahead and take them off too as well because they will slow down the uh, productions of blossoms during the middle of the growing season. Okay, but the question is, what do you do with all this? You know, do you, do you just yank off the, the spent blossoms and be done with it? Well, no. The correct way of doing it, and it, it's also problematic because beneath that spent blossom, you're going to find that you've got a whole bunch of new leaves growing, right? And they're just going to be in your way. And they're going to be uh, a little thorny, a little stickery. So you want to be careful just thrusting your hand that in there. So here's the secret of deadheading. You're going to have a spent single blossom or a whole spray of blossoms that have been spent. Now this, of course, shows a whole spray, but you can you can kind of put your hand up in front of your eye and knock off this side of the of the spray, and this becomes kind of like a, a single blossom. And down below those, you're going to have your leaves growing out of those uh, canes, but you don't want to pick these particular bud areas for your prune because these have only got three leaflets on them. What you want to do is you want to go down a little bit further and you're going to find leaflets that have got anywhere from five to seven leaflets growing out of the cane. And then you want to pick a, a leaflet that has got an outward facing bud eye 
and that's going to be a little bit easier because it, by this time, after the blossoms have faded, uh, you'll find that there's going to be a little pimple of a blood of a bud, often being developed down there at the end of the leaf axle. So it's easier to kind of aim the direction that you want this new shoot to come out, and that new shoot will eventually uh, develop more blossoms. So that's the secret of deadheading. But uh, you need to do that all during the growing season so that you continue to have uh, the beauty of the rose that you planted, uh, giving you the expectations that you expect. Okay. okay. Expectations that you expect. Okay, let's go on. We're, we're finished with pruning. Uh, very simple subject, very easy to do. And as I said before, at the very first of that section, don't worry about doing damage. If, if, if you do make a mistake, uh, it's like a, back, a bad haircut. It'll grow back in. All right. Well, let's first talk about pest control. You want to make sure that you employ what we call integrated pest management. And basically that is, basically that is <coughs> you don't want to uh, select the most harmful solution to your problem. Uh, you want to take the, the easiest way out and use the least harmful way of solving that problem. You know, in some cases, uh, just doing nothing is the solution because the insect or the, or the causal agent has already left the, the plant, no longer around, and has gone someplace else, and is no longer chomping on your rows. On the other hand, you may be able to see the agent and know that you've got, you know, aphids, or in some cases, uh, some smaller insects, or not really insects, but uh, uh, mites on your rows, and then you can pick away uh, to handle them, but it's not going to kill your rows and it's not going to uh, ha damage the environment. And always read your labels on your landscape products, because after all, in the case of pesticides and herbicide, herbicides and um, um, other sides. <laughs> You're handling poisons here. They may be poisonous to uh, some other organism, uh, like insects or, or fungi or something like that. But uh, they could be doing you and the environment harm as well if they're not handled and not uh, uh, applied correctly. So read those labels. Don't just read them once. Read them every time that you uh, use that product. Um, here's a common pest that you're going to find in your roses. Uh, they'll pop up almost every every early spring, even before you think that they should be there. Uh, they in the early spring you'll find one or two uh, having a good time underneath your uh, your leaves and your rose. They'll be very 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 small, uh, but I'll show you a way to. Uh, to identify that you've got that problem, oftentimes even before that you can turn over a leaf and find them. Of course, later on in the springtime, uh, they're going to lay eggs, they're going to reproduce, they're going to uh, have a mass of them, and they're all going to be traveling upwards, and you're, you're going to find up around your, your blossom buds and on the stems that connect that blossom uh, to the rest of the rows. And you're going to have an infestation. You're going to say, Oh dear, what am I going to do? Okay. One of the ways to tell early on that you've got aphids uh, on your rose is that you look at a, a wreath, you look at a leaf, and you see that it's shiny on the top, like somebody had shellacked it. Uh, and that's called honeydew. It's the droppings from the, uh, from the aphids, and they drop down below the leaf that they're on and form this layer and it will literally be, uh, you know, from side to side, from tip to the end, uh, look like somebody has polished your leaf. Uh, in areas where they have a lot of humidity, like Florida or 
down around Corpus Christi, uh, and you get honeydew on a leaf, you'll find that you may have sooty mold growing on top of that. That's just mold that's growing on top of those droppings from the aphids. Uh, I, I haven't seen any sooty mold here in El Paso. We just don't have enough uh, humidity to worry about it. But I can tell you it was a big problem in Florida. Also, if you've got folded or curled leaves, or of course, if you've got mass feeding on the stems and buds, it's a good sign that you've got aphids. Now, a lot of people will say, you know, well, the natural predators will take care of those. Well, they will if you've got a very small number of aphids that you're having to worry about. But if they become a real problem, uh, probably the best way to do it and the, the, the least toxic way is just using, using a strong spray of water to take those aphids off the rows. Uh, now, a few kind of aphids do fly, not many, uh, but once they're off the rows, uh, they, they should be off far enough where they won't be coming back. Uh, if you come back in a couple of days and you're still there, and they're just as heavily infested as they were before, you might consider using an insecticidal uh, soak spray. Uh, those are cheap, they're available. <clears throat> they're not overly toxic to other insects. So you might try that too as well. But we recommend, first of all, using that strong spray of water. Secondly, after the aphids have disappeared naturally on their own, when it heats up in the, uh, the early summer, uh, they're replaced by spider mites. And these you'll find all over El Paso. If you don't think you have them, you probably do anyway. Uh, they're just everywhere. Uh, oftentimes not in heavy infestations, but oftentimes there'll be one or two on your plant. And they're tiny pests that are on many, 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 many times the plants. Trees, shrubs, roses, uh, you'll find them anything generally that's above ground level. They're related to uh, uh, ticks and spiders, and they really like living in a hot, dusty living environment. It's one reason why we have them in El Paso. That's a pretty good descriptor for our, our climate here. Okay, they're very difficult to see. And when you're scouting for them, if you think that you might have them, and you see rose leaves that have got little yellow spots on them all over. Well, that's a pretty good indication that you've got spider mites. If you'll take that branch and you shake it back and forth over a white sheet of paper, and then you see any of the dark spots that fall on the paper start moving around on their own, then that's a pretty good sign for certain you've got spider mites. Control measures, again, you can uh, spray them off by blasting them and the dust off the roses. Now, spider mites don't fly, they just walk around. Uh, they kind of use uh, their uh, web device on the end of their posterior to swing like Tarzan from leaf to leaf from a, a tall plant to a short plant. But you'll, you'll see that once you spray them off, uh, other than the ones that may hatch out in the next day or so, uh, they won't readily come back onto the same rows. Again, you can use a uh, contact insecticide or a miticide if they come back in force. Uh, neem oil is, is a pretty good miticide. It, it does a lot of things. It is a natural product that can be used organically, uh, as long as you use it under 90 degrees Fahrenheit, because uh, that could do some some damage, spraying a, even a diluted neem oil onto your roses. And then you need to repeat that measure as needed because those spider mites do travel around looking for new roses and new plants to live on. Thrips, uh, thrips are a real problem. They're hard to see because they're real small. They're a lot bigger than a spider mite, uh, but they do fly. 
and they like to live and dine inside rose blossoms. And the best indication is if you've got blossoms that look like this, then you've got thrips. Uh, the, the hard part to understand is, is they will fly onto your rose. You won't be able to see them because they're so small. Your blossoms will open up and they'll set up housekeeping inside your blossoms. And there's almost no way of getting to them inside that blossom other than completely destroying that blossom and squishing each individual thrip on its own. So don't try to use insecticide because you're not going to see them when they arrive on your rows. And so the spray treatments are usually ineffective in the first place. So just cut off any damaged open buds or any blossoms and discard them into the trash. And you're doing the same thing as squishing the individual thrips. As long as they're in a closed bag and a trash can, uh, they're not going to come back and give you any problems on your roses. Okay, this is the last one. This is one that we did not intend to cover here, except that <clears throat> last month, at the end of the month, I got a, an email from a good friend of mine. He said, Doc, what do you make out this is? And he showed me a photo that looked like this over here. And then he took this picture of a wasp that's embedded inside of a chamber on his rose when he was doing the, uh, the pruning cut. Well, this is called, very simply, a rose cane borer. And there's a number of different kinds of wasps uh, that are responsible for this. That's why if, if you take this picture and uh, look at it close up, this really looks like a, 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 a little wasp that's all curled up inside there. Uh, what happens is the wasp will come along. It'll find an open uh, pruning cut. It'll make a hole in it. It'll create a chamber and then it'll lay one or more eggs in that chamber. And those eggs will hatch out and then the nymphs will actually uh, be little worms that'll gnaw out that chamber and continue on down the cane. And it may uh, weaken the cane to the point that in a stiff wind that they become broken or damaged, or it may actually kill the entire branch of the rose. The only way to take care of those is, is to keep a lookout. Number one, to see if you've got little holes in the end of your uh, pruning cuts. And the way to prevent having little holes made in your pruning cuts is to take some inexpensive wood glue like Elmer's and just put a little dollop on the end of every pruning cut that you make. And that'll prevent these little wasps from being able to go into the rose tissue. Uh, we don't do that in the rose garden because up to this point, we haven't discovered any uh, evidence of rose cane borers in the in the in the uh, rose garden. But since we're uh, at, at least finding now one homeowner that's got rose cane borers, I thought it would be a good idea to make sure that we include them in this presentation. So go out and look at your roses that you've already pruned. Uh, if you only have a single rose, it won't take you long to put a little dab of wood glue on the top of those rose cuts, uh, particularly if you live out on the east side where he lives. And so that should take care of the potential for any kind of rose cane borers. If you've never had problems with rose cane borers, uh, I can't say that you absolutely have to use wood glue on every pruning cut. Uh, because like us in the Rose Garden at uh, 1,500 bushes, we'd have to buy wood glue by the gallon, and it would take us until the middle of the summer to get through doing the pruning on all those roses. Okay, Master Gardeners always get questions about this in the middle of the, uh, the spring or the summertime. People call in or people will see us at an information table and say, I've got scallops all over my leaf. What's causing that? Well, the, the answer is very simple. 
it is that they have, fortunately, a leafcutter bee. And it's a solitary native bee uh, that is also a pollinator. And so it is uh, an insect to be protected because it is a pollinator and we need every one of those that we can uh, have around our garden. Uh, it rarely, ra rarely stings uh, because you rarely see it. And the last thing is the leaf damage is only cosmetic. Uh, unlike other uh, critters that will eat on your leaves, it's not really eating them. It's actually making a cut on them and it really doesn't deposit any kind of saliva or chemicals that causes that to die back or turn brown on that, on that edge. What it looks like is looks like this, that uh, some maniac uh, ticket taker has come down and really did a number on your leaves. Uh, and as I said before, it really doesn't do any damage. They'll stay like that until they fall off. But if you're really worried about how your plant looks, whether it's a rose, uh, this is not a rose. Uh, this is some other kind of landscape plant. Uh, the only control measure that I found, other than squishing bees, which is not to be recommended, is to cover your rose with cheesecloth to protect the leaves. Uh, to my mind, that may look worse than just the minimal damage that the leafcutter bees do in the first place. But if it makes you feel better to have a non scalloped rose bush, go ahead and buy yourself a nice piece of cheesecloth and maybe make cheese in the uh, wintertime. Rose diseases, diseases, we're almost done here, by the way. <coughs> Excuse me, another sip needed. Here's a lineup of the uh, diseases that I think probably rank among the most usual suspects that you'll find in El Paso. At least these are the ones that I find in El Paso most frequently. Uh, powdery mildew being probably the, uh, the worst offender. Uh, I have seen some rose mosaic disease, but that's because it came in on the rose when it was purchased at the, uh, the big box store or at the nursery. Anthracnose is a, a fungal disease that we have in El Paso that can grow on roses, a certain type of uh, fungal disease. There's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of them that do cause the uh, overall disease cover we call anthracnose. And uh, some of the roses in the, uh, the rose garden have got a, a type of crown gall, so we do have it here. Uh, it is soil born. Uh, and once you've got it in the soil, um, it takes about 15 years for it to move on to someplace else. Now, on this presentation, I did put in a ringer because everybody, when they call in, this says, my rose has spots on the leaves. Must be black spot, right? Well, no, it probably isn't black spot because black spot needs certain conditions to grow that we just don't have here naturally in El Paso. Now, if you've got a, a lawn sprayer that hits your rose daily and the temperature and the uh, uh, weather in the springtime is of the right type, then you might have black spot, but in general, you won't have that. Let me back up one second here. I would recommend all of you to make a note that you want to get a hold of a copy because it's free, A Guide to Rose Diseases and Their Management. Uh, this was written for the American Rose Society by two brothers, Mike uh, Wyndham and Alan Wyndham, and also another professor of uh, plant uh, uh, diseases, Alan Hen, I believe it's down in Mississippi. And it is absolutely uh, the best overall uh, document that I found, uh, you'll find it, should come up here in a second. It's loading. You have to go down and then you have to open up the PDF file. And this is on my small screen. 
but uh, this is a cover of it and it's got 26 pages of, of just every kind of disease that uh, they could find in the United States that might uh, affect the roses, uh, including the one we're going to talk about in a second. And they have a very good description of it. Uh, we have an overall description of, of what it takes to have a disease called the disease triangle. And it goes down and they talk about the uh, rose diseases and their management. Uh, very good article uh, or publication. We're just glad to have you back. Um, <laughs> we have just so that you know quickly, we have uh, participants from Virginia, uh, Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, Pat belongs to a Midland Master Gardeners and uh, others so far from El Paso. Well, y'all, welcome to El Paso. You'll just have to excuse any fumbling around we're doing here. We're all new to this uh, technique for getting a hold of people and, and passing on information. So uh, it, it's just one thing after another, but we're learning and uh, we'll do the best we can. So again, welcome to y'all. Uh, let me try to get back in here and uh, I'll finish up real quick. We've only got one section left to do. Okay, and while you're at that, Doc, um, Anne had a question about, uh, um, she has a jug of dry rose food. Um, she wants to know if she should use it or if it gets old. Um, has it gotten moist? No. No. Um, how old is it? Uh, I'm trying to unmute. Years. <laughs> some of it might be two or three years. Some of it might be older. And you uh, know, at the stores, it just says rose food. So, it's rose, rose food. But it, it doesn't indicate to you, you know, what, what percentages of nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus is in it. Does. If I were to read the label, it probably does. You know, I just okay. have it. Well, it yeah, it probably does because that's federal law that it does. Um, I would say probably uh, that if it was a, a uh, slow release product um, like Osmocote, you know, one of those, that's got a coating around the, uh, the nutrients uh, that dissolves slowly over time, uh, that it probably a couple of years old still might be viable as far as a... Uh, a fertilizer. But one of the funny things about nitrogen is that it will volatize, that is that it will escape into the atmosphere. It is nitrogen and that's what most of the atmosphere is made up of. Uh, and it, particularly if it gets wet, uh, it'll, it'll create uh, nitrogen that flies off into the atmosphere, even in the soil. So after a couple of years, if it's just dry, uh, fertilizer granules, uh, I'd go out and buy another box, but maybe not the same box. I'd go ahead and get a soil test first and then figure out if you need to have those other additional nutrients in your soil. Uh, because as I said, uh, the primary nutrient, especially here in the, uh, the Southwest is nitrogen that we need the most because we just don't have the organic matter naturally in our soil, uh, just because things don't dry or don't uh, live and then die and then fall into the soil and uh, give us a nice black uh, gumbo soil like they have in Mississippi or, or even up in Kansas. So I, I, to answer your question, I, I wouldn't trust a box, a box of uh, a fertilizer more than two years old if it's not uh, a slow release fertilizer. Let me try to uh, open up this darn presentation again.
Okay, are we back online here? Um, I still see your your screen. I don't see your presentation yet. Okay. I want to talk to you about Rose Rosette disease. And, and there's a reason for that. And the people that have seen my Rose Care presentations in the past uh, know very well why uh, I'm so much of an advocate of letting people know about this disease. Uh, first thing is, of course, is that, that the question, well, why are you talking about it? Because we don't have it in El Paso County. Well, that's true. Uh, but this disease uh, is in Texas and it is in uh, several, if, if not many, uh, counties in Texas, primarily up around the Denton, Fort Walton, uh, uh, Fort Worth and um, Dallas area, but it's spreading to other areas too as well. And all roses types, old roses, new roses, modern roses, wild roses, all roses are believed to be susceptible to this disease. And it will kill your rose in three to five years. There is no cure for it. But while it's waiting to be killed, uh, it serves as a reservoir for a virus, which is what causes this disease. And it can be spread, that virus can be spread as these roses are dying. And so if you've got a whole bunch of roses that are all infected with rose rosette disease or RRD, um, you can be infecting whole neighborhoods or as they're finding out now, whole counties with this darn disease. There is research that has been going on. It's been going on since the 1940s when this disease was first uh, observed, but recently uh, it's been more focused. And so we know a lot more about it than we did before, but we still don't have a cure for it. Now, this is just to give you some idea of where Rose Rosette disease has been seen in the United States. And as you can see, Back in the east, they've got a lot of it back there. Uh, they do have it on the west coast. Uh, we do have it in Texas, and we do have it in the southeast. Uh, what's been worrisome, uh, 10 years ago in Texas, it was only just reported in some of these areas up there around Dallas, Fort Worth, over here in the uh, Piney Woods sections of, of Texas. But then in 2019, we got a big surprise. It was discovered in Midland, Odessa. And that's only 300 miles from El Paso. And as I tell you the rest of the story, you'll understand why we were concerned. So anyway, it is now spreading westward when all logic says that it shouldn't be spreading that way at all. Uh, and so we're really, really worried about it showing up in El Paso. And particularly, we're worried about it showing up in the municipal rose garden. Well, this is the vector for the rose rosette disease. Uh, it is a microscopic mite. And it was not this really uh, separated until 2011 by a, a fellow over in the University of Arkansas. And so it's only been that long that we've really known that this is the vector that carries the virus that infects roses with rose rosette disease. So it's a rather new development that has uh, given us uh, all this ongoing research. Hold on, there we go. But here's, here's the kicker. This little mite is microscopic. You can't see it with the bare eye. It takes a microscope to put them on slides or to look at a, a rose under a microscope. But they're so tiny that they can be blown around on the wind. And what happens is, according to uh, Mark and, and Alan Wyndham, is that it, when the temperature gets up in the mid-80s, 85 to 90 degrees, these little mites will 
sort of go back on their tail and raise up their two little feet. And they're hoping to get caught by a breeze and be blown off this rose. And it's their way of traveling around. Now they can walk uh, a bit very slowly, but their main mode of transportation is to be blown around like dust on the wind. And then we call that ballooning. And what happens is that from an infected plant, the mites will be blown into, let's say, a bed of knockout roses. And then if those mites have been feeding on a, a portion of the plant that has the rose rosette disease infestation, then they may transmit that infestation or that, or that virus to those other roses that they land on. And this picture was taken by Mark Wyndham and he uses it in his presentation and he uses it full size. So this is a, a poor representation of what he shows you, but he shows us this entire bed and he asks you to find the rose rosette disease in that bed. Well, actually there it is right there this little tiny spot right here. And in three to five years, if this isn't treated or managed, this entire bed is likely to be killed. So anyway, this is what to look for. This is your scouting trip or tips for rose rosette disease. If you see a new shoot come up like this one, and it's got uh, distorted parts of it. The leaves are very narrow compared to the leaves on the rest of the rose. And it's got increased number of thorns or prickles on the outside of the uh, stem. And the stem is could be either red or green colored. And the leaves could be uh, red colored as well. Now, a lot of people will say, well, leaves on my rose are red whenever they come out in the springtime. Well, that's right. But they will eventually turn green because of the chlorophyll that's being manufactured in them. Generally, the leaves on an infected rose with rose red, rosette disease will not change to green. They'll remain red the entire year. And also they could have misshapen rose buds. So here's, here's the thing that people have a hard time swallowing. Since there's no cure for rose rosette disease, the best management procedure is that as soon as you find that your rose has got rose rosette disease is to put a plastic bag over it, or if it's too big for a plastic bag, to wrap it in plastic to make sure that no more of those mites might escape on the wind from it and inspect and infect other roses in your landscape or in your neighbor's landscape. And then dig up that rose, including the roots, and then put it into the trash. But here's the secret. Those mites will die in five days if after being blown from their infected rows, they don't land on another rows. Now they can travel quite a ways on the wind, but if they take five days to get somewhere and they aren't fortunate enough to land on a rows, then they will die. And so you can wait about a week and you can transplant another rose into that hole that was left by the plant that was infected. Not bad. You just swap a diseased plant, excuse me, for another plant that's not diseased. And then you have to carefully monitor the bushes around you uh, and the soil too. You see, if you didn't get all the, uh, the roots up and some root shoots might come up that may be infected, uh, just to ensure that you stop the disease. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but this is the the last rose of the roses that we took from grandma's house out in Kentucky and 
Uh, if we destroy that rose because it's got RRD, uh, then we're not going to have a substitute for it. Well, that's just it. But if you've got any sense about you, that rose is going to die anyway. And you're, you're saving other roses in your neighborhood or in your landscape by taking that rose out. Okay. If you have any questions, you normally can call the El Paso Master Gardener Help Desk. It's at 771-2353. Uh, That's the same number for the El Paso A&M AgriLife Extension Office. And you can call that number and just ask for the help desk. Except that during the pandemic, we're not permitted to be in the building where uh, we have the help desk, so there's nobody there. Uh, but we are taking some, some changes and we're going to try to implement them so we can have the help desk open back up. And, and that could be as a result of putting uh, the ability to have an online chat uh, on our website, uh, the El Paso Master Gardener website, which is available just by Googling El Paso Master Gardeners, both our Facebook page and our uh, normal website will come up there. And uh, you can uh, go into the website and go to the, uh, well, we, once we get it started, excuse me, you can go in and you can go online and hopefully you can chat with a person from the uh, Master Gardener Help Desk, uh, just like you would with any other uh, manufacturer or customer service organization that uses uh, websites. Okay, or you can send us an email uh, and that's available also. I was gonna go down here and I was gonna click on this and go and show you a picture of the website. But after what happened last time that I did that, I'm not going to do it this time. So you can go to this uh, same website for the Master Gardeners in El Paso and open that up and go to the Ask Us tab, which will be shown at the top of that picture. And uh, it'll take you down and you can type in an email and attach pic pictures to the email uh, with any uh, photos of the problem that you're trying to describe. And a master gardener will now, even still in the middle of the pandemic, uh, respond to your problem. All right, boys and girls, we're down to the final bit of it. Uh, can't give you any more information about springtime with roses, uh, but just keep in mind that there's some things that you should remember you need to keep the soil around your rose roots deeply moist, uh, but not soggy, because your rose will die probably of root rot if you submerge those roots, those roots into uh, to water on a long time basis. You need to fertilize your rose bushes with nitrogen every four to six weeks from mid January to mid October. That's just a rule of thumb. But of course, to know that you should also have a rose uh, soil test done to make sure you know that what percentage of, moist, of, of nitrogen you should be applying to your rose bed uh, in square feet, for example, not just the two tablespoons that uh, New Mexico State University recommends. <coughs> and also, uh, you can remove your damaged, your dead, and your disease canes at any time. Uh, even in the middle of the, the summer or the, the fall, if you find any of those happening, take them off your rose bush. You don't have to wait to the, the spring to do that. And finally, in order to solve problems before they happen or to correct them if you got them, just keep calm and carry on scouting roses and hopefully. Uh, we won't find any rose rosette disease in El Paso County uh, next week or, or next year or any year in the future. I want to thank you all very much for your attendance. Uh, Rosie, do we have any questions that I need to answer? At this point in time, uh, you've answered all the questions that came in. 
Wow, what a presenter. There's no questions. I tell you what. <laughs> what what can you ask for? No, actually, just uh that's one of the things that I try I another fan has heard from. Uh one of the things that I do try to do, I try to do these presentations and the thought process I process I use is well, what would a, a homeowner ask me about, you know, lawns or or selecting plants or or roses uh, do a lot of presentations around El Paso uh, and so matter of fact I've done this presentation in Arizona New Mexico and uh, in, in uh, Texas for the different master gardener groups but anyway hope you enjoyed it uh, keep your eyes open for any other presentations that are going to be available for uh, our adult outreach program. Uh, we're trying to have at least one or two a month. And uh, as we go along and we get better at this, I think that you'll find that uh, they're really beneficial. I know that I had fun. I oh, hope you did too. So we'll hope to see you down the road online sooner or later. Bye-bye. Take care. And don't mess with Texas. Thank you.